and he is risen indeed, and that makes all the difference. And that makes all the difference. And which we will look at this morning in the, our text in John, that Jesus makes direct claim to be divine. He is equal to the Father in every way. And because he is God, uh, even though he was killed and put to death, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us, in, or Peter, excuse me, says in Acts, we know that death could not contain him. And so we celebrate the risen Christ today. By way of announcement before we begin, uh, let me just invite you after the morning service finishes, uh, we will take about a 15-minute break and uh, let you guys get your wiggles out and the kids can let the, get their wiggles out and then we'll come back in here for our Christian Education Hour uh, to review the sermon and talk about some personal practical application. Uh, also, Wednesday night is prayer meeting and uh, we'd love to have you come out. Uh, I pray that you would come out. I'm not opposed to using puns to do that. God is in favor of puns if you've read the Minor Prophets. <laughs> And uh, we would love to see you out here on Wednesday night, 6.30, 7.30, as we will lift our, our cares, our concerns, our needs, and our praises to our God. would love to have you with us. If you were here this last week, you got a nice jump start to a, a little bit of today's uh, worship order of service. I'll speak to that here in just a moment. Actually, I'll do it just now. You have a little odd-shaped insert today. I usually try to keep them half sheets, but you got a full sheet insert in your bulletin today. Uh, we will be singing this song called Why Do the Nations Rage? Now, trust me, I'm not introducing two hymns of the month for you. I realize the words of this song are probably new, but uh, the tune is not. You're very familiar with the tune. It's the same tune as Crown Him with Many Crowns. Um, and so, uh, and also, what's the others? Soldiers of Christ Arise. Thank you, Charity. Uh, we've sang both of those hymns. And so, same tune, very familiar tune, just some different words that just fit with our call to worship and where we're going in the text today. So, uh, we will sing this song. So, I wanted to give you a full sheet so you could see it nice and big, and then we'll have a couple of extra verses on the back, per usual, uh, for our hymn of the month and for our closing hymn. So, as we gather here, take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Psalm 2. We actually looked at this psalm in a little more detail in prayer meeting Wednesday night. We're just going to read it briefly and address the main theme as our call to worship this morning. But follow along with me as I read this important psalm. This, I think Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 help us understand the whole book of psalms and are very important in that regard. But we'll hear the word of the Lord. Why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh, the Lord, and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. Yahweh said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Jesus Christ is going to look at the religious leaders of his day and declare to them that he is this son. And they are not going to kiss the sun in joyful submission as they ought to have. This is a, a, 
This is a psalm that presents a choice. You either live as the, pe the people who set themselves against Yahweh God, or you live as the people who kiss the Son, who bow the knee to Him, acknowledge His deity, His Lordship, and bow your knee before Him. And if you do, the psalmist concludes, blessed, happy are all who take refuge in Him. We are gathering as those who have come to find refuge in Jesus Christ, and I hope your hearts are happy and will be made happier yet today in the joy of the Lord. So let me pray, and then we will stand and sing these great songs of praise to our great God. Let's pray. Father God, gracious Lord of all, ruler of the universe, and the one who will soon send his Son to reign, God, we bow before you and we want to joyfully and willingly kiss the Son and pledge our obedience and our loyalty and our faith in him. There is no other way to be happy. We will either serve you or we will serve ourselves and other lesser gods. Father, we want to be free from the slavery to self and the slavery of those things which aren't gods. We want to be free to worship you joyfully. And so, Father, work in our hearts today. Cause us to be those who rejoice in the Son, who rejoice in knowing you and who worship you rightly. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Take your hymnals and turn to hymn number four. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, hymn number four. Turn to hymn number 106. This is our hymn of the month. Let us love and sing in wonder. So on the back of your, your insert page, uh, we have verses 5 and 6. We'll sing off of there. 1 through 4, we'll sing out of the hymn book. 
and then verses 5 through 6 uh, we'll sing off of your insert which is a full page and again I apologize for that let's sing let us love and sing and wonder for your good singing. You may be seated. I apologize. You, uh, you learn songs in certain hymnals and sometimes they change the words just a little bit. So I'm still getting used to Pastor MacArthur's hymnal. So forgive me on the second or third verse where I keep singing the other words to it. I appreciate you guys not getting totally lost and just smiling at me. That's good. All right. As we wait on our uh, men for the morning offering, we'll, we'll, they'll hold on to the plates. If you want to put the offering there, if you're not comfortable, you can set it in the back in the offering box. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you are so good to us. You have lavished uh, your Son upon us. You have graciously given us all things. Father, there's nothing more that you could give to us. And given that your Son is in the strictest sense eternal, we could never give back enough to pay you back. So, Father, we do not try to do that. We simply want to express our worship to you by clinging a little less loosely to the things of this world, to the things that this world holds up as worthy of worship. And so, Father, help us to relax our grip on our earthly possessions and monies. Father, help us to use them as the tools that they are, good tools to spread the gospel here in the Otsego and surrounding areas and around the world. Father, we pray that you would bless these funds, bless the Flinks, our missionaries in Chile, bless their ministry there, and as they seek to return from their uh, furlough, we ask that you would bless uh, our funds as they go forth in that country. 
We pray the gospel would spread there. <coughs> Father, help us to be good stewards. Uh, and help us to worship you with glad hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Take your hymnals again and turn to hymn number 53. Mighty Fortress is our God. This great hymn of the faith. And when you found number 53, if you would stand with me and sing. The Mighty Fortress is our God.
Thank you. You may be seated. Take your inserts, if you will, this full page here. And we're going to sing this hymn, Why Do the Nations Rage? Thank you, sir. This is an excellent summary of Psalm 2, set to an appropriate tune. And then verses 4 through 5 cover some of the remaining themes in Scripture surrounding the Son of God and His claims of authority. So, the words are new. I'm going to have Charity just play through the first verse, so you can take your time reading through the words together of the first verse, and then we'll sing all five verses of Why Do the Nations Rage? Go ahead. If all could see Jesus Christ as he will appear on that day, there would be no choice. And on that day, there will be no choice. As C.S. Lewis says, it will only reveal what you have already chosen. And so the time is now. Do not be like the Pharisees and harden your hearts against the sun. He will come with a crowned brow and flaming eyes. And every eye will see him. And as Paul tells us, quoting Isaiah, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Now is the time to bow before this son. Before we get to our sermon, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? It's John 5.
Our scripture reading this morning is John 5, verses 1 through 29. If you're using a pew Bible, it's found on page 890. I'm reading from the ESV, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 29. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew what he had, and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all the judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor God, the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Have you ever met anyone famous? I I haven't. Not not anybody who would make the news. Uh, Maybe people famous in my small hometown in Ohio. Uh, More... Maybe a different question. Have you ever met someone famous but you didn't know it at the time? Again, I guess it would be kind of hard to answer. I I heard a guy give a story who was an English citizen uh, and he was at a restaurant and he was waiting. There was a line for the restroom, so he's waiting. There's another guy in line waiting in the restroom and he thought the guy looked familiar. And the guy, he kind of looked at the guy like, do I know you? And the guy kind of had a, some of a bashful take on it, and it wasn't a 
nodding, smiling, like maybe we know each other. Uh, and the man didn't realize it. He goes back to his chair before he realizes uh, that it was Prince William of England, his future king, and he didn't even know it. He's standing next to the guy like, don't I know you? <laughs> I, I've never had that kind of experience. Don't anticipate having that kind of experience. And that gentleman may have missed out on a chance to say something to his future sovereign of the country in however, whatever little sovereignty the monarchy has left in England. But it's probably not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I've never passed by a congressman or a senator or a presidential candidate that I'm aware of, you know, in the airport. I always look when I fly, but I never see anybody that I know or anybody famous. But again, it's not that big of a deal. But the problem in our text today is not first and foremost that there was a man who couldn't walk for 36 years. The problem is that the religious leaders, those who knew the Torah of God, who had probably memorized the first five books of the Old Testament, did not recognize their coming king. Did not see him for who he was. And he even will take the time to reveal himself to him. So then it's not a matter of recognizing. It's a matter of rebellion. But for the Englishman in the restaurant, there was no civil penalty for him not bowing the knee before his future king in an informal <laughs> gathering. But there is, in the strictest sense, everlasting or infinite consequence to those who do not bow the knee before the coming king of the universe. And so as I summarize our, our text today to you, I would summarize it in this way. You must bow before the authority of the Son. You must bow before the authority of the Son. I see, think our text answers the question why and gives us three reasons First, because Jesus has powerful authority. Second, because Jesus has righteous authority. And third, because Jesus has divine authority. We'll look at those three ideas in our text today. First, number one, Jesus has powerful authority. We see here that John tells us there is a feast of the Jews. Now, John mentions several feasts in his book. Uh, this is the only one he does not name. And so, we don't know which one it is. There's lots of guesses, and I, in my reading this week, I found that a lot of smart men did a lot of study trying to figure out which, beach, which feast this was. And the conclusion was, well, we don't know, because John didn't tell us. But it, it, it likely, I think, probably was Passover, if it was. This is the fourth the second of four Passovers in John's book. John is very helpful in that regard. Matthew, Mark, and Luke only focus on Jesus' final Passover. And so if you take the chronology from those books, you'd come up with a time of maybe about 18 months of Jesus' ministry. John, however, gives us three explicit Passovers and maybe this fourth one that gives us a timeline of about three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. It's very helpful for filling out the chronology of that. But whatever feast it was, it was important, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem to worship, uh, as the Jews were required to do. And he comes by the sheep gate, called Bethesda, by a pool called Bethesda. And this pool had a, a special place. It was the gathering of all the sick. And it seems the chronically sick, the continuing sick, the significantly sick. It says the blind, the lame, the paralyzed people who were beyond the cure of, of known medicine at the time. And so there's one man who tells us in verse 5 who had been there 30, or had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, verse 6, he knew that he'd already been there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? Let me back up just a second. Why are all the sick people laying there? 
Well, the text doesn't say directly, but we can ascertain the meaning from the rest of the text, it seems like. The lame man, presumably the rest, were waiting to be healed. He tells us this in verse 7. He said, Sir, I, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. Someone gets down before me. So there, there is this belief that there's a stirring of the waters, and then uh, someone who gets in first uh, gets a healing. Okay? Um, there is no record of this in Scripture. There's no promise of this in the text. God said, hey, I've set aside the healing pool in Jerusalem, and uh, whoever gets in there first, after a certain moment, will we'll get healed. I think this is, is largely a, a superstition that had developed over the years. Um, but Jesus comes to him, and it says, Jesus saw him there and knew that he had already been there for a long time. Now, how did Jesus know the man had been there a long time? Well, I think we have two options. Number one, he's God. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And so he could have just known the same way he knew that the Samaritan woman had had five husbands and was the man she was with was not her husband. Or, number two, he could have asked. And again, as I have said throughout our, our time through John, without further evidence saying to the contrary, we should assume that he asked. We should, Jesus lived his life out the same way you and I did. Now, he was able to, uh, for lack of a better term, access the divine prerogatives, um, utilize them, and at times he does. When he does the miraculous, Jesus is showing his divinity loud and clear. These are things that you and I can't do. But he lived his human life here within all the limitations of unfallen humanity. Uh, and so when, unless the text says the contrary, we should assume he had the same limitations that we had. So he did some investigating, finds out there's a man here who's been a long time. Now he asks him, do you want to be healed? Well, some have surmised that Jesus is doing a psychological evaluation of the guy. Do you really want to be healed? Um, because most of us know that we're not going to make changes in our lives unless we want to be. I don't think that's what Jesus is doing here. I think this is, uh, this is Jesus' means by starting a conversation with a man. In the same way, he looked at the Samaritan woman and said, give me a drink, please. Jesus is using this to, to begin conversation with him, uh, to deal with an issue in his life. I said that Jesus has powerful authority, and we see here in verse 8 that that power is absolute. This man is waiting, presumably, for some kind of miraculous healing through some superstitious endeavor that this pool is going to be stirred up and he's going to get in there first someday. It's been 38 years and he hasn't gotten in there first. And so he remains lame. Bad luck. Bad circumstances. Not enough good friends. No help. But Jesus comes with an absolute power and says to him in verse 8, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. This power is absolute in that it's not contingent on resources. Jesus' power is not contingent on how much money he has, how much military power he has, how much personal strength. Right? We think of people of power today, we tend to think of people who have wealth, right? They can say, oh, you need a new house? Here, let me write you a check. Oh, your car broke down. Let me just buy you a new car. Here you go. Money can get you things. It can get you lots of things. The more money you have, the more things you can get. And sadly, the more people you can bribe. Proverbs tells us this. And so, money has, there is power in money. But money doesn't have absolute power. Uh, money can't go into the hospital and clear out all the sick and diseased and the lame and all those with COVID-19 and Down syndrome and uh, congestive heart failure and COPD. Money can't do all that, nor can military power. We think of great 
powerful nations who can impose their will on others, correct? How many of those great powerful nations have ever ruled the entire world? How many of those who have ruled the entire world or known world are still ruling it today? Babylon is gone. Persia is gone. Alexander the Great is not so great anymore. The Romans are gone. Military power does not last. We've seen that all throughout history. And we have seen smaller countries overturn power for more powerful countries in military conflict. And personal strength. It's nice to be strong, isn't it? Nice to be able to lift yourself up out of bed without help. Go about your day, do your work without help. But sometimes you need to say, hey, could you help me lift this, please? Or could I borrow your truck so that we can lift and move this, please? Right? All of us have limitations to physical strength. Thinking of, of power in Scripture, think of Pontius Pilate. We'll get to him in a few months, in a few chapters. Remember he says to Jesus, you, you, why don't you speak to me? Don't you know that I have the power to release you or the power to crucify you? How good was that releasing power there, Pilate? Wasn't that powerful that day? He caved and cowered to the Jewish masses, even though he had the power of the, of the nation of Rome behind him. He caved before a few hundred or a few thousand protesters. Every known power that you and I have is limited, and it's temporary. Jesus' power here is absolute. He looks at the sick man, the lame man, excuse me, and says, get up, take up your bed and walk. And instantly, he's healed. That is divine power. That is absolute power. His power is not limited to timing. Could a good surgeon or a good physical therapist have produced the same result in this lame man? Possibly. Possibly. With enough skill and enough equipment, maybe, maybe not. But Jesus didn't need the time. Jesus didn't have to go to school to learn surgery. Jesus didn't have to go learn physical therapy. And he didn't need a few sessions to try to get the guy's muscles working back together. He just looked at the man and spoke with absolute power. This is the kind of power that belongs to God and God alone. This is the first indication in this chapter that we're not dealing with a mere mortal man. This would support John's claim of this book, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. The God who made us is the God who can absolutely, excuse me, heal us. Remember Moses standing at the burning bush? Oh, God, I, 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 I can't go to, I can't go before Pharaoh. I, 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 I stutter. I have a trembling lip. What's God's response? You're right. We should have scheduled some more speech therapy lessons for you, Moses, and we wouldn't have had this problem. No. He says, who made man's mouth? Who makes man deaf or mute or speaking? God. That's right, God. Absolutely right. God is the one. And so if Jesus standing before them has the power to speak this man into health the way that God spoke the universe into existence, he is revealing clearly that he is God. There's no question here. Thus, the first reason that you must bow before the authority of the Son is that Jesus has powerful authority. The second reason is that Jesus has righteous authority. Jesus has righteous authority. The second half of verse 9 says, Now that day was the Sabbath. As uh, 
Sherlock Holmes author, I'm blanking on his name, would say the plot thickens. Any other day, everyone in Israel would be rejoicing. This lame man is healed. 38 years he sat here superstitiously believing in that which would not heal him. And yet this man, this Jesus of Nazareth, claiming to be Messiah, claiming to be God come in the flesh, just healed him. Praise the Lord. What a day. But no, not this day. The Jews, the religious leaders, are furiously upset. He's broken the Sabbath. Now, is that true or is it not? Um, it is not true because the Sabbath forbids ordinary work. So if ordinarily you go out and plow your fields and harvest your fields on the seventh day in the Old Testament, you should not go out and do that. It is a day set aside for physical rest, both for you and your entire house, even for your servants, even for the stranger who lives among you, the foreigner. It's a day of rest. Why is it a day of rest? Because God set a pattern for us. God created the world in six literal days, solar days. He created the world. And on the seventh day, God rested. Why did God rest? Did the Milky Way galaxy tire him out? Absolutely not. He was not tired, but he set for us a pattern. He showed us that we ought to take one day in seven to rest our bodies. It's also for a preparation. Our bodies need, let me back up to the physical rest, our bodies need regular rest. Now the question is, uh, does this apply to us today? And I will freely admit that theologians are quite divided on this. Uh, the specific, uh, what I think scripture is emphatically clear, is that the church is not under the law in any way, shape, or form at all. And so, if this were based solely in the law, I would say then no, the, the church is not bound by these regulations. Uh, but I would contend that the seventh day of creation is not a part of the law. It was given before the fall, before sin had ever corrupted this world. God made provision for man to rest. So I would say we ought to take one day in seven to rest. In the Old Testament, it was, it was on the seventh day because that's when God rested. We have changed that to the New Testament. I don't think we have changed it. I think Jesus has changed it because of the resurrection of the dead and the church acknowledged that. All right. Again, I've probably used this illustration before, but how do you think the nation would respond this next summer if whoever is president says on July 1st, for the next 30 days, there will be no fireworks set off. It would be pretty hard for us to shake that tradition, right? That tradition is 244 years old, going on 245. Okay? The Jewish tradition of worshiping on Saturday was over 1,400 years old. And they did traditions way better than we do. Okay? It was no small thing for the apostles to say, Jesus is risen. We are going to gather on the Lord's Day. And the New Testament writers refer to it as the Lord's Day. And so I have no problem calling Sunday the Christian Sabbath or the Lord's Day. Uh, and I think that is a day we should set aside to physically rest. But it wasn't set aside just for physical rest. It was set aside for the, the health and well-being of our souls. It was set aside for worship. And we ought to spend the Sabbath day in acts of worship. Uh, I want to point to you briefly to Hebrews chapter... Uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself. 
back to the question of work. I think Jesus makes clear that there are two exceptions to work. Uh, the first one is a matter of necessity. The disciples are walking through the fields, right? And they're hungry. And so what do they do? They pluck some heads of grain, rub them together, and enjoy a nourishing meal. And what happens? The Pharisees get ex extremely upset. They're reaping. The law forbids reaping on the Sabbath. Yes, it forbids you going out in your field and bringing in your whole crop as your means for making money. It does not forbid you from eating on the Sabbath. And so acts of necessity uh, can be done. It's why we are happy that police officers work on, on Sunday, right? Because we live in a world with bad people and who don't take Sundays off. I wish they did. I wish all the bad people would come to church and not do bad things on Sunday. It would be a much better world than Tom could come here on Sunday and we'd be fine. Okay? But that's not the case. And so it's okay for Tom and for hospitals and doctors and things to, to work because they're necessities. Also, Jesus pointed out the acts of mercy are, are allowed, even if it involves work. Your ox falls into a ditch or your child. And you say, whoa, it's going to take me an hour to get you out. But it's the Sabbath. I'll see you tomorrow, son. Absolutely not. Get the child out of the ditch. Get the ox out of the ditch. If you see your neighbor's ox fall in the ditch, go help your neighbor get him out. Okay? Or if your neighbor's tree falls on his house, go over and help him. Okay? These are acts of mercy, which Jesus clearly supports. And so, again, the Sabbath is a day for rest. It's Saturday in the Old Testament, Sunday now on the resurrection of the Christ. But it's a day for rest, physical rest from ordinary work. And now that I've tried to run ahead of myself twice, I'm on time now, spiritual rest for your souls. Just look briefly, if you would, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, if you would like. And I'm only going to read a short part of it. This, this, the whole first 11 verses deal with it. Uh, but for the sake of time, we're just going to look uh, at verse 9. We'll back up to 8 for context. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There is a rest that is coming for God's people. It's called the kingdom. It's called the age to come. It's called heaven. And in that rest, we will worship and our souls will be perfectly strengthened and sustained. And so as we take this day to worship, it is a day to prepare ourselves for that rest which is to come. That's why verse 11 says of Hebrews 4, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. The Sabbath is a day for preparing our hearts to long for the kingdom, to long for that rest which remains. And so it's a day, yes, for physical rest. It's a day also for spiritual rest, for the care of our souls as well as our bodies. And so the Sabbath has good purposes for not working. The Jews were not wrong in the, in the idea or the principle that work shouldn't be done on the Sabbath. But this is not the work that God forbids. Jesus is healing a man. He is restoring a man. And so he tells him to get up, take your bed, and walk. So the Jews are upset about this. They're saying, why are you, why are you carrying a load? You're not allowed to carry a load on the Sabbath. The specific reference to carrying a load comes from Jeremiah chapter 17. And he's speaking about the merchants who are bringing in their wares to come and do business in the temple, in, in the city, on the Sabbath. And he's saying, don't do that. 
This day is not for the day for making money. This is not a day to sell your wares and your crops and everything. This is a day for rest and for worship. It doesn't mean that a lame man can't carry his bed home. And so we see here, as I said, Jesus has righteous authority. He has authority to determine the law. Jesus is the one who laid down the Sabbath regulations as the angel of Yahweh. This, the law said to do no ordinary work. This work was not ordinary. It was not arbitrary. And it was the Pharisees who created many, many, many more additional laws. Because the law said, just don't do any ordinary work, the Pharisees went to great efforts to explain what ordinary work was. And they created a whole host of other laws, including do not carry your bed on the Sabbath. But Jesus has authority to determine the law. And as such, Jesus never broke the law. If someone says to you, Jesus broke the Sabbath, uh, you can say, brother or sister, I know you mean well, but that's not the case. Jesus perfectly fulfilled God's law, including the keeping of the Sabbath. And when his Sabbath duties were in question, he explained them. We're eating bread on the Sabbath. There's nothing wrong with that. We're making, I'm making a lame man well on the Sabbath. Jesus has authority to determine the law. He also has the authority to do his Father's will. Jesus says down there in verse 17, My Father is working until now, and I am working. He is doing exactly what he has seen his Father do, and he is doing exactly what his Father has commanded him to do. This is the essence of the law is to obey God the Father. And so, Jesus is not breaking the law. He is showing his righteous authority. And here is where the Pharisees and the Sadducees lose it. Look at verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath in their eyes, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The only way, no, no, no Jewish man could say, well, I'm just doing my father's work. My father is clearing his fields, so I'm clearing my fields. That was forbidden. But Jesus is calling God his father, and God does not cease from his work. God does not cease from sustaining the universe. God does not cease from hearing his people's prayers. God does not stop his work on the Sabbath. And Jesus did not either. So thus the first reason why you must bow before the authority of the Son is that Jesus has powerful authority. The second reason is that Jesus has righteous authority. And the third reason is that Jesus has divine authority. Again, he claims his authority to be equal with the Father, starting there in verse 17. So the conversation, so now they know he has claimed to be God. And I picture in the, in the, in the temple area or by this pool, the healing um, the circle starting to draw around Jesus. The religious leaders coming around him. They know what he has claimed. And so Jesus takes this time to teach them. He says, Truly I say to you that the Son can do nothing of his own accord, verse 19, but only what he sees his Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Jesus' authority is equal to the Father. Look at verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son gives life to whom he will. Jesus has authority over death. He says, the Father, verse 22, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. 
Jesus has authority to execute judgment. He says that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Isaiah said, Isaiah 42, 8. God is speaking. God the Father is speaking. He says, I am Yahweh, the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. God was not in the business of sharing his glory with anyone ever. Share his blessings? Yes. Share his love? Yes. Share his creation? Yes. But he does not share his own glory. That belongs to God alone. And Jesus tells them that the Father wants you to honor me as you honor the Father. He has just claimed four divine prerogatives. He is equal to the Father. He has authority over death. He has authority to give life. And he deserves the same glory as the Father. Jesus could not be more explicit. And then he concludes... He continues, truly, truly, I say to you, verse 24, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Jesus has authority to give life to those who believe in him. And so the call is simple at this point, is it not? Pharisees, Sadducees, you and I, believe Believe the word that Jesus speaks. He is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing you have life in his name, bow the knee to him and him alone. But the Pharisees have competing allegiances and you and I have competing allegiances. We have things, unfortunately, in our lives that we want more than to see the glory of God magnified than to bow the knee before him. If you want to know what those things are, find out what is it that makes you upset. What gets you and I bent out of shape? What disturbs our equilibrium? Is it righteous indignation 100% of the time? No, it's not, unfortunately. And when our little gods, little G gods, are disturbed, they begin to rattle and make noise. Jesus has come to set us free from all of those. But if and only if we bow the knee before him. Finally, Jesus concludes, verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man, repeating that. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to, resurrection, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus finally has authority over the resurrection of the dead. He has made it emphatically clear. He's not let the Englishman slip back to his table without revealing his identity. He has said to them, I am your Messiah. More than that, I am God in the flesh. I am the Son promised in Psalm 2. Now bow before me. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in his wrath. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Even you, Pharisees, come. But they will not. 
Thus I conclude the first reason that you must bow before the authority of the Son is because Jesus has powerful authority. The second reason is that Jesus has righteous authority. And the third reason is that Jesus has divine authority. How do we do this? I think I've already said it. Bow the knee. If you are not trusting in Christ today as your Savior, as your God, then bow the knee before Him. Confess your sins and beg for His forgiveness and He will forgive you. If you are His child, you are His follower, how firmly are you trusting Him? How much ground have the competing gods gained or lost in your life this week? I pray they're losing ground. John Calvin said, I think it was, the dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me tear it from my, th from thy, my throne and follow only thee. Our hearts are warehouses of, of factories of idols, Calvin said. We must be diligent Diligent in God's word, diligent in prayer, diligent in worship, diligent in walking in holiness to make sure our lives are, are bent before the Son. That's what we're called to do. Let's do it for his glory and for our joy. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you and your Son and your Spirit are worthy of all, of all of our worship, all of our obedience, all of our love and affection. And God, we have fallen sadly short of such a measurement this week. But God, would you help us? Help us to look in faith to your Son. Help us to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Father, may our life be to the full as you intended it. God, help us to spread this message to those who have not yet embraced and pray for their quick humbling and quick submission before the Son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, take your hymnals with me. For our closing hymn, it's hymn number 195, Rejoice, the Lord is King. We'll sing the first three songs out of the hymnal, the first three verses, excuse me, out of the hymnal. The last three verses are on the back of your insert. Hymn number 195. The first three verses are in the hymnal. The last three will be on our, our printout. Stand with me when you find it and sing. Rejoice, the Lord is King. And pause on that, please, because I just... Did something bad and put the wrong hymnal in here. I all wrong hymn number. I apologize. Rejoice, the Lord is King. One sixteen, one hundred and sixteen. Rejoice, the Lord is King.
Excuse me, I apologize. For our benediction, <clears throat> let me get a drink before I do that. For our benediction, let me take you back to where we started in Psalm 2. <clears throat> I think it sums it up best. Now, therefore, O church, be wise. <clears throat> be warned, brothers and sisters. Serve the Lord with fear <clears throat> and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Go in peace. You are dismissed. Amen.